Okay, welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to everybody joining us on uh, Zoom. Welcome to everybody here in the room to Life Community Baptist Church this morning, August the 22nd, 2021. Um, you're very, just to say, I'm very funny. Thank you. Yes, I'm trying to be the comedian this morning. Um, that's right. Absolutely. Um, and the news this morning is no. Uh, you're very welcome. If you're joining us later on and watching it recorded, you're also very welcome this morning. Um, so we are this morning uh, in our fourth week of praying um, specifically for the life of this particular church. Um, that's what we're using the sort of summertime to do, uh, what we feel we've been called to do, um, and how we can have a bigger impact in our community and what God wants to do with this particular community. So we've been using the Lord's Prayer to guide our, um, our prayers, and this week we've arrived at forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's interesting to hear the three different languages that are used in that prayer sometimes and what that might spark, what associations might come to us differently with the different language used as well. Um, and how we might use that aspect of the Lord's Prayer this morning to uh, anchor our praying about the life of our church and our community. Quite a challenging one this morning. Um, I have to say that um, I was down to lead and I was prepared for that. What I wasn't necessarily prepared for was that is um, our Pastor Pete's unfortunate last minute absence. He's... Um, come down with a really bad cough and he was in A&E last night having his asthma checked out. Um, um, he is feeling better this morning, I think, but it's absolutely important that he stays rested and on the mend. So we, uh, we wish him well and I'm sure we'll all be praying for his uh, very quick recovery. So I am, so I've put something together to stand in for that as well. Um, <laughs> rather last minute, but I hope that works. Um, Let's just begin uh, together with uh, a call to worship that Pete had prepared for us to say. And then Sarah uh, Hill and Paddy Hill and Matt Hill, the Hill gang, <laughs> are going to lead us in some worship to begin our service this morning. So um, on the screen, we're just going to um, have some words that we, if you can, would you, in, if you can and you're in the room, would you stand? Sometimes it helps us show we mean business. So um, I'm going to read the stuff at the top and everything in bold and join me in, please. From different lives, we come to worship. From good weeks and bad weeks, we come to worship. Bringing great times and painful memories, we come to worship. Needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts. We come to worship. To the Almighty God, we come to worship. To the King of Kings, we come to worship. Together, we come to worship. Right, if uh, Sarah and Paddy would kindly take my place. There we go. Make sure that you're in shop. I'm just going to. While we just wait for the, the words to appear, why don't we just pray this morning? Lord, I thank you so much that finally we can get together. I thank you for every single person here, including those within the room and within our Zoom as well, and might be with us later. Lord, I pray for Pete as he's not here. I pray that you are with him as you are with all of us. Amen. And we say we welcome you here, Lord. Amen.
Yeah, Lord, we do remember this morning that your our ability to be in relationship with you and to meet with you and to sing to you, to, to call you Father, is completely contingent on you and your faithfulness and your faithfulness to your covenant with us, not on us. And um, we thank you for that. We thank you for what Jesus did, making a way, um, pouring out his love and forgiveness through, um, through what he did on the cross and then the life he brings and the life and the hope that's promised um, through his resurrection and your kingdom coming in, not just in our lives, but in, in the world, the whole world for everybody and everything um, in your creation, Lord. We thank you and please help us to humble our hearts this morning to hear from you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right. I'm just going to reposition myself <laughs> in the camera. That's great. Lovely. Take a seat. Thank you very much to Sarah, Matt and Paddy for leading us so well there. Um, forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, forgiveness is not just one of those like tenets, simple if you like tenets of Christianity. Uh, I would argue it's central to the kingdom that Jesus came to bring. Without forgiveness, you know, Jesus, the forgiveness and being able to forgive people and being forgiven, completely blank slate type forgiveness, is what Jesus' radical upside down kingdom is all about. And when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, our ability to forgive and our forgiveness attitude and the way that we have been forgiven is completely central to that happening in the world and that happening in our lives. Uh, I'm just going to read some verses from the Bible that talk about forgiveness to sort of contextualize. They're by no means the only verses in the Bible that, that talk about forgiveness, but I've selected a few um, to just share. So Proverbs 17 verse 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offence but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. And again, Proverbs 10, verse 2. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Mark eleven twenty five. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus said, the Last Supper, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 6, 14, 17. For if you forgive other people, this is Jesus speaking again. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. And the tricky bit. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins quite challenging isn't it psalm 65 verse 3 when we were overwhelmed by sins you forgave our transgressions ephesians 4 verse 32 be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as christ forgave you god forgave you in christ sorry just as in christ god forgave you luke 6 verse 37 i'm nearly there i promise do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Colossians 3, verse 13. Bear with each other. This is like our family motto, just so you know. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. There's a theme here, isn't there? Okay. And then connected you have heard it was said love your neighbor and hate your enemy 
But I tell you, Jesus telling us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. I don't think Jesus meant any of his words there to be taken lightly as options. Neither do I think he expected it to be easy and for us to be able to do it without his help. But it certainly is something we must always be working on, forgiveness. So much so that he said we should pray it in a daily prayer, daily, hourly, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Because we need help to do both things. We need help for our forgiveness, but we, boy, do we need help to grow forgiveness in us, don't we, for other people. Um, hopefully, we're going to now play a podcast clip. Yes, we are. Um, again, you'll have, uh, I used this um, from Tim Mackey, who is uh, the founder of The Bible Project. I've spoken about this before. It's a fantastic resource. If you haven't come across it before, it's wonderful. Please check it out. The, uh, the Bible Project, it's called. Everything's available and free, um, and it's, there, it's so wonderful. So he did a, a, a sermon, if you like, on the Lord's Prayer, on his understanding. And this is the section that he, where he is speaking about the part of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. of Jesus. The second thing is forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. So Jesus already explored the importance of forgiveness, right? That was back in, in chapter 5. He's going to explore it again in his teachings as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. And this is such, for, forgiveness is, is so at the heart of the kingdom movement. There's something about the power of forgiveness as heaven takes over earth that Jesus thinks we need to daily like burn this into our brains. I am forgiven. I am called as a disciple of Jesus to forgive. And a part of what Jesus sees so utterly wrong with humanity is the fact that we keep asserting our rights to get even. And so one wrong is responded to by creating another wrong. And then one wrong is responded to by creating another wrong and it's just this downward spiral. And so on, on the cross, like both in the kingdom announcement, but just straight up in this moment right here, Jesus declares that the spiral stops. And as humanity's representative, he, he takes the hit. He absorbs all of the consequences of, of human sin and broken relationships into himself, and he doesn't, he doesn't get even. And he forgives. It's his words from the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing as he's like getting nailed up there. And then Jesus invites his followers to see that what he did right here was for them so that they too could experience that forgiveness. But then he, he, Jesus fully intends that this forgiveness is something that spills out into the world, that we forgive as we as we have been forgiven. Now forgiven, it's complex and really, really practical and difficult, uh, and it's easily misunderstood, Jesus' teachings on, on forgiveness. Forgiveness is not in the teachings of Jesus just brushing wrongdoing under the rug or ignoring it or somehow condoning it by saying, it wasn't that big of a deal, I, I forgive you. That's not Christian forgiveness. If you look at Jesus' teachings, Matthew 5, we'll get there again later on in chapter 18, Jesus' view of forgiveness is fully naming and drawing attention to the wrong that has been done. You fully, like it's right there, name it for what it is. Horrible, wrong, stupid, selfish. That was, that was lame. But what you do, the move that you pull at that point is to choose to release your right 
for full recompense or getting even. And again, look at Jesus' teachings, Matthew 18. It doesn't mean there are no consequences for what they did to you. And it certainly doesn't mean that you're best friends again. Actually, Jesus fully intends, like, if the appeal for forgiveness doesn't work out and they reject you, then you go back with a few others, then you go back with some more, but you're never alone with that person ever again. You create these, these barriers around you of safety in the community. And forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation in Jesus' teachings. Reconciliation requires two people to humble themselves, to own what has been done, to extend the offer to forgive, and then the relationship is repaired. But as you know, well know, that is not always possible because that requires two parties, but not forgiveness. In Jesus' view, forgiveness is, is, takes one, and the disciple of Jesus, to give up their right to retaliate and to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to give up that right because Jesus gave up that right to me. And I, and I begin this journey to begin to view this person as a human being still bearing God's image and dignity. They're really screwed up and I don't ever want to be alone with them again. But all to say, I'm like, they're a human being and I'm, I need to come to a place where I can at least somehow wish them well. It's the movement of forgiveness. And notice that Jesus, he knows that this is so gnarly. Look at this, so verse 12. He actually follows this up after the prayer. Did you see it? He says, it's like, yeah, I know that was a hard line, so let me make it even more difficult. Look at verse 15. He says, for if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will for also forgive you. And if you don't forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> and really leave it to Jesus to just say something so stark like, like that. But apparently Jesus thinks that this is so at the heart of the Jesus movement and the kingdom movement that he doesn't say if you struggle to forgive, and he doesn't say if it takes time for you to forgive. He says if you refuse. If you do not forgive, what you're showing is that you have not actually internalized the grace and the forgiveness that has been shown towards you in the first place. That Jesus, apparently for Jesus, the number one sign that the grace of God has really sunk in deep in my heart and mind is my ability to both receive it and out that same pipeline to give it right back out towards others. It's not the same as reconciliation, but it is this movement of the heart towards that person. And this is it's the heart of the gospel. And so Jesus knows that this is hard. And so every single day, he wants us to internalize this and to, and to pray for strength and power in the forgiveness movement of Jesus' people. we can choose that with God's help <laughs> always um, we can and that can be a work and when I thought about that this idea of um, it being a work of the heart and this giving up your right it made me it, it brought me back to somewhere that led me on to the next part of the service so about 13 or 14 years ago many many years ago now it feels um, I found myself um, really blessed to be present at an event held in a church I used to attend. I lived in um, uh, near Datchet, near Windsor, before I, I lived here. And we went to a church called St. John's uh, in Egham. It was a large uh, Anglican church. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were able, because of their size and facility, to host lots of events. And one of the events they held was this very uh, amazing conversation between two people. So what's so amazing about an event that's a conversation between two people? I hear you say. Well, I will tell you. Um, so the first gentleman was actually the father of one of the, um, one of the late girls that I used to um, do worship with in the congregation. I didn't know that he was famous, but he is. Um, 
Some of us might remember um, Harvey Thomas, the Conservative MP. Um, he was one of the Conservative members of Parliament present at the party conference in Brighton and was in the Grand Hotel when it was bombed by the IRA in 1984. He was severely injured. He was stuck under rubble for just over three hours with cold water pouring over him. And he talks, he talked about that evening about um, how he felt in those moments. He was anticipating death and a slow death. Thinking about his wife, it was just, it turned out five days away from giving birth to uh, one of his children. And uh, it was, you know, very, really moving to hear him talk about that and the trauma, uh, how he could hear other people calling out and you, know, you can imagine, you know, how awful that would be. The other person in the room that, we were, that they were talking, the other man, part of the conversation was Patrick McGee, the bomber. The man who in fact uh, was a member of the IRA and set the bomb that killed in fact five people that day and seriously injured Harvey Thomas. And that was a very interesting event, a very interesting conversation. Um, the purpose of the event was to share their mutual journey of transformation through openness, through forgiveness, through empathy with each other's situations, and really through learning to see the other as a person, learning about each other and humanizing each other. Mm -hmm. and some sort of restorative bridge building. It was quite miraculous. Now, Harvey Thomas, he identifies as a Christian and he would talk about that being a movement of the spirit in his life to lead him towards seeking that. Um, one of the people killed in the bombing was Sir Anthony Berry and his daughter, Jo Berry, is founder of a charity organization called Building Bridges for Peace, uh, an organization where Harvey Thomas and Patrick McGee also play key roles and um, I, certainly Patrick McGee still travels with Joe Berry around the world doing work to talk. I mean, so she's part of that too. And I find when I think about forgiveness, I always think about that evening because it was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And I find their approach and demonstration of forgiveness, their openness about the journey they're on, the fact they're all on it together, despite the different roles they played in, 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 in their lives and their histories together, completely inspiring and completely uh, humbling, really, to listen to, especially when I consider those small fright issues that I struggle with around forgiveness. And then I think about what they're dealing with and I think, you know, get over it. <laughs> For myself, I think I can do, you know, I can do this. Um, so uh, we're gonna see in a moment, a short clip of, Joe Berry talking about a conversation that she had with Patrick McGee the second time that she met him. I won't, I, there's so much I could say. And certainly if you go to the website, Building Bridges for Peace, you'll be able to hear her whole lecture. But this, she was talking uh, across uh, to many people all over the world through her organization in April, 2000, uh, 2021. So very recent, the most recent thing I could find that she'd said, talking about her journey of forgiveness. And she, she doesn't necessarily identify as a Christian. I don't think it matters because when you hear what she says and the things that she's doing, uh, I, I don't really care about that because she's, for me, she's doing God's work. She's bringing peace. She's restoring lives. She's speaking the language of the kingdom, I would say. Um, and I think it's something we can all learn from. So this is, She's talking now about having met with Patrick McGee once. There's a whole journey for her getting to that place. So she's the daughter. She was in her teens when her father was killed. She's the daughter of one of the MPs that was killed. Um, and she pursued this herself over many, many years, trying to connect with um, people in the IRA to understand. And then when Patrick McGee was released as part of the Good Friday Agreement, she realized that that was something she had to do. She felt compelled. Many situations, uh, the universe, she would say, conspire to bring her to that place. We might explain it differently, yeah? To bring her to that place of meeting with him where he was willing to listen. And they did sit down for three hours together uh, in Belfast in a small conservatory in the back of her friend's garden and talk. Um, and we're gonna try now to get to the place uh, in the talk that I wanted just to listen to. Um, 
because what she says is uh, amazing, I think. Just give us one moment just to get to that place. And he was. When he planted that bomb, he saw no one in the hotel. That is the nature of violent conflict. But he's now seeing my dad as a human being. And after another hour and a half, I had reached my limit, three hours of, of listening to him. And I thanked him and said, I'm gonna go now. And that's when he said, I'm really sorry I killed your father. Now I didn't go for that apology because an apology wouldn't do anything for me. But what I got from that was far more because now my dad is being humanized, being rehumanized. He's seeing my dad as a human being. And I'm now seeing Patrick as a human being. As I left that meeting, I knew I'd have to go back for a second one. It was not finished. After that meeting, I had feelings of betrayal. I felt disorientated. I thought, what would people say if they knew that I've met the guy who's killed my father and seen some of his humanity? It was a very hard, I was very on my own with it. There was no one around me who could understand. But there was something in me so strong about I have to go back. And the second meeting we were filmed, which later became a documentary and we went public. And the, the second meeting, my six year old daughter decided to come with me. Well, she didn't, but she wanted to come because she had a message for him. And when I gave that message to Patrick, there was another time of him being disarmed. He would later say that if I'd gone in shouting and, and being angry, he would have stayed in a very safe place of righteousness. But he was disarmed by my empathy. And then when my daughter had a message for him, which was, please tell him that was a very bad thing he did to kill my granddad, Tony. That was another sense of him of realizing the ripple effect, how many people were affected. And so he begins his own journey of healing. Now that was 20 years ago. And it's 20 years of extraordinary experiences of traveling together. I've been to places where he's the only person I know. We've had riots when we've spoken in Belfast. He's moved me to tears. He's frustrated me so much that I want to stop and I've taken a break. It's stretched me beyond any way, but I am being transformed through this dialogue and I've been learning so much. There was a time when I remember early on, he shared so much about his story. And I remember thinking, if I'd lived his life, would I have made the same choices? And in that moment, there was nothing to forgive. There was just empathy. And I've had that empathy with an ex-British soldier. I've had that empathy with an ex-loyalist paramilitary. So all different sides. I've had that connection with people who are in the police, with the peace women, with all the different stories. There's so many stories from Northern Ireland. And what I draw from that is there are no sides. There are just people's stories who we haven't yet heard. And for me, an enemy is someone whose story I do not yet know. And when I hear everyone's sides, then I get a sense that if only we could listen to each other, then we could find a way to not have the kind of conflict that happened in Northern Ireland. The first time Patrick and I shared in public, we had maybe like three minutes each, not very long. And Patrick said, I now know I could have sat down and had a cup of tea with Joe's dad. Now the Conservative government didn't have a policy of cups of tea with the IRA. They're still not very good at policies of cups of tea. But for me, a cup of tea is about dignity and respect, even when we disagree. And at the moment, there is a lot of polarization going on. There's lots of othering going on, not just in the UK, but in other parts of the world. And even I sometimes can get a sense of righteousness. And to me, righteousness is a start. It's the first step to demonizing people. It starts with a sense of, I'm so right in what I think that I'm not gonna listen to you. 
I'm going to tell you you're wrong. And as soon as we make people wrong, we've somehow begun to demonize them. And Patrick has shown me what can really, really happen when we demonize each other. And so that righteousness is me is something that I work on every single day. How can I let go of being right? Because I really believe there's a world beyond right and wrongdoing. And that's what we're talking about. But of course, it's not enough just to live in a world where there's no right or wrongdoing, because things do happen. Hurt does happen. We all hurt other people and people hurt us. And what can we do differently? How can we challenge each other's behavior? And there are times when Patrick's moved back to justification again, for really good reasons. Maybe there's someone in the audience and he feels very defensive. And sometimes I get very defensive. And then I found ways to challenge him while still allowing him choice to change. We can't force change. Forcing change for me is a form of violence, but change happens through choice. There's so much research done in restorative processes that people have been in prison many, many times when they finally meet the victim of one of the crimes and they understand that story, they choose to change. Patrick chose to change that day. If I'd gone in there telling him, you must change, you're a bad man, he would never have changed. This relationship is all about, I'm choosing to change and he's choosing to change. And that in the nature is non-violent. To me, the old way is forcing people to change. But when we take responsibility, I really believe when bad things happen to us, we have no choice. Some people think maybe you do, but I don't. And we all experience such hard times, but we have complete power of how we respond. And I see it's like a sword that when we're hurt, we want to blame someone and make them wrong. We can either use our sword to metaphorically hurt them, or we can put the sword in the ground and say, I am taking my power back. I'm not going to let this affect me any more than it needs to. I'm going to find a way to bring something positive out of this. All my feelings are understandable, but my feelings do not need to be connected to the person or the trauma or the thing that caused it. So if I'd spent the last 30, five years, however long it's been, maybe more, using Patrick as an excuse for my life being hard, and it has been hard. I would have been hurt twice, once from him killing my father, and secondly, from having him in my head in a negative way. Mm. I would have given myself a sad, desperate story of I am, I'm a victim. But I changed the story, and we can all change our story. So when he's when I'm thinking about him, I'm thinking about the man who's been courageous enough, who's trusted me, who's listened to me many, many times. So he's no longer just the man who killed my father. There's that wonderful saying when that revenge is eating poison and expecting the other person to die, but it only hurts ourselves. So this is about ending the cycle of violence and revenge. And the first thing to do in my experience, and you've probably got your experience, is to take the power back. I'm going to find a way to make myself feel better, even though right now I don't know how to. And you know, something happens when we take our power back and go, I'm going to heal this. I'm going to transform this. Then we start finding our next steps. Maybe someone starts listening to us. Maybe like what happened to me, that amazing miracle in the taxi clues start arriving. We start finding the support. And we have to keep on doing that emotional work, and it is emotional work. All our feelings are understandable. And how can we feel our pain and our anger without hurting anyone else? That's some of the work I do. It's pretty amazing what she says. I'm just going to read again from Matthew. Now, it might sound a bit different after listening to that. You've heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. 
But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So we are going, as we have done in the uh, last few weeks to move into a time of praying in small groups and praying in breakout rooms in small groups for those of us that are on zoom with us for our church and you have an opportunity now to reflect on uh, what you've heard so far today and respond in praying for the life of this church community and its future what role does forgiveness play in praying for our church mm. there might be some difficult answers to that forgiveness for individuals and perhaps when we say forgive us our debts our debts there's a sense of the collective here that interests me a sense of a collective sharing of difficulty but also a collective responsibility as well that is a a mindset that we don't tend to have very well in our culture we're not schooled in it so perhaps something just to think about as we pray um so i'm going to ask we'll be about uh 15 about 15 minutes to pray once we get into groups um, and then we'll bring us back together. As always, there'll be a time for people to share on Zoom. Very welcome to share. Give us a wave or here in the room. Anything you want to share uh, that you think God's been talking to you about, anything that comes out of praying, anything at all. It doesn't have to be on the theme of today. Just to um, bring, bring God's word in a different way. Um, that'd be much appreciated. Let that idea sink in. Maybe something will um, emerge as the praying time uh, moves on. So... I'm just going to, Andy, I think is going to sort Zoom people out into breakout rooms. So we'll see you Zoomers when you get back.